NASCAR was built on short tracks, not on one and a half mile tracks or bigger or even road courses. In NASCAR's inaugural season, for example, all but one race was at a short track. There were many venues at which these short track events were held, but one was shorter than the rest. And at only two tenths of a mile, two fifths the size of Bristol, one thirteenth the size of Talladega, and shorter than a running track, the Slip Speedway was the shortest track NASCAR ever raced at. Built in 1947, Islip hosted races up until 1984. In the then called NASCAR Grand National Series, raced there between 1964 and 1971, with the exception of 1969 and 1970. NASCAR axed from the schedule heading into the 1972 season when they decided to ax every race shorter than 250 miles. This is one of many reasons why people see 1972 as the beginning of NASCAR's modern era. But I find this interesting because people are asking for shorter races nowadays. And the Bristol Dirt Race was 125 miles, and last year we had the Daytona 235. And the Indy Road Course was only 200 miles. One interesting thing about a slip that you may not know is that that was actually a site of the first ever demolition derby in 1958. And after a figure eight was added in 1962, ABC broadcasted a figure eight world championship and a demolition derby world championship at Islip. This made Islip known as a world famous track. And in 1964, the NASCAR Cup Series came here for the first time. All the races were held in July and most of them were 60 miles, which is 300 laps. The first race held in 1964 was the 39th race of the season. Billy Wade, who had won the last two races, his only two wins in his career up to that point, and he also won the 1963 Rookie of the Year, he got the pole and he led the first 97 laps. However, on lap 98, Ned Jarrett took the lead. Billy Wade took the lead back from him on lap 193 and never looked back, winning by over a lap. Wade would win the next race, his fourth in a row, and that would be all the wins he would ever get in NASCAR. In 1965, Marvin Pants racing for the Wood Brothers led all 250 laps en route to a win from the pole. The 1966 race saw Tom Pistone, who hadn't won a race since 1959, win the pole at the fastest pole speed for uh, any of the NASCAR races there. It was about 55.919 miles per hour or only 12.88 seconds. And he led the first 146 laps before getting passed by James Hilton. Pistone would DNF due to a wheel bearing after 184 laps. Hilton then led the next 146 laps, but on lap 293, he was passed by Bobby Allison, who led the final eight laps to win his second career race. Allison started from 7th position, which was the deepest any NASCAR winner started from in the field at any Islip race. This race also had the highest recorded attendance of any Islip race at 10,000. In 1967, Richard Petty won the pole and led the first 46 laps. Bobby Allison then took the lead and led the next 73 laps. On lap 120, James Hilton took the lead and led the next 61 laps. On lap 181, John Sears took the lead and led 40 out of his 62 laps that season. He never won a race in NASCAR and got passed by Bobby Allison who proceeded to lead the next 60 laps. With 20 to go, Richard Petty took the lead and ended up winning the race by 3 laps. This race would have the most lead changes out of any slip race and it also had the most cautions with 5 telling 29 laps. The 1968 race saw Buddy Baker win the pole and he led 95 laps. Richard Petty took the lead from him on lap 96 and led the next 97 laps. After that, David Pearson led 80 laps. Finally, it was Bobby Allison who had won there two years ago who took the lead and led the final 28 laps. He ended up winning the race by six car lengths over Pearson. When you see what happened in the 1971 race, you won't be surprised why NASCAR left. First, the race had to be shortened to 230 laps due to a scoring error. Not sure what it was. And seven drivers had a DNF for quit, all within the first 13 laps. According to Wikipedia and Slapshoes, this was because they saw the leader in the rear view mirror before they saw the green flag to start the race. As for the actual race, Richard Pay won the pole and led all 230 laps and won by two laps. That race also had 33 cars, which was the most NASCAR tried to fit at Islip. 
Now, in 1972, NASCAR did come back with the Grand National East Series, which was a NASCAR series that ran in 1972 and 1973, and Bobby Isaac did win that race. The racetrack still remained active until 1984 when it was torn down to build a cookie factory. And here is an aerial shot of where the Speedway would be today. At its prime, there were a few other tracks on Long Island with Islip, but now only Riverhead remains, so the logistical nightmare didn't help anything. Only Neil Castles and Wendell Scott made each of the six races. Richard Petty had the most earnings with his two wins that was tied with Bobby Allison for most. He also had the most amount of top fives, but Neil Castles had the most amount of top tens. Scott completed the most laps, but Petty led the most. Hilton led the most laps without winning a race. Next year, the NASCAR Cup Series will have a clash at the LA Coliseum, and that's going to be a quarter of a mile. That's about as short as most racetracks come, but this slip was just a little bit shorter than that, a fifth of a mile. NASCAR will never race at a track shorter than that. Now that I've talked about the shortest track NASCAR has ever raced that, you're probably wondering what the longest track was. And well, it was the Daytona Beach Road course. That's pretty well known. Uh, if you guys want to see me make a video about that, let me know in the comment section down below. I think it's too well known. I don't think I'll make a video about it. At 4.17 miles, this answer may sound anticlimactic as that is one of NASCAR's most famous old tracks. So thank you for watching. If you did enjoy, make sure to leave a like to show your support. And if you are new, hit that subscribe button and so you don't miss out on other content just like this and more. And if you really like this and you're already subscribed, why not just hit the bell? That way you won't have to rely on the YouTube algorithm to make sure you don't miss any of my videos.